Uh, my task is to talk a bit of more about what this means for the workforce. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, my whole career has been devoted to looking at the implications on the workforce for the disruptions that we've been talking about today. Uh, and I have to say that to begin with, that technology usually gets a very bad rap in all this because in fact, the elements of disruption and change is a story that is repeated over and over again in American economic history and world history. And technology often plays a part, it almost always plays some part, but I want to remind us there are a couple of other things that are really important too. First of all, there's the macro economy. So how much growth is there, how much inflation, uh, how much capital is available. Global trade uh, is important and of course uh, it has become uh, more of a political football in the last uh, election, but it's something that's always part of understanding the economy. Competition um, to deliver the products to people at the most cost to grow your business. Mergers and acquisitions, um, which uh, have always been part of our history. Consumer preferences and changes in demography. You know, think about uh, what's happened to the American station wagon, which used to be a popular car when I was growing up, now replaced by trucks, um, SUVs, and so on. Very simple innovations. You know, Sam Walton moved the checkout to the front of the store. I mean, that was his innovation. And that created the elements of the big box store, which began to uh, kill off many of the old fashioned retail stores. Um, and, and of course, more complex ones, which was uh, developed by the internet. But what all of these have in common is they displace people uh, and they lose their jobs. Now, first of all, how many of you know, probably not too many, raise your hand if you will admit this, that 75,000 people have lost their job today in the United States. Did you know that? Okay, so there's a lot of people get laid off every single day. And the cause of that is a mixture of these different uh, phenomena. Uh, and what's also common about all of these disruptions and Jim went to this out, um, David and Dawn, is that we can't really predict very well what, how significant the change is going to be uh, and how quickly it will occur. So what's the scope and the speed? What's different about the contemporary economy is perhaps that all of those things I talked about, those elements of economic change, are occurring simultaneously and faster than previous iterations of the same story. So we talked about artificial intelligence, for example, as uh, I'm sure David knows and, and many of people in this audience. The estimates of that are everything from nothing to half the jobs will disappear. That's a bit of too much air, it seems to be, for, for saying that we can put a, any handle on it. Every inflection point in economic change uh, that I've studied uh, is the same. There's dire predictions that the world will end, that millions of people will be thrown out of work. Uh, but what we do know is that from those past stories is that over time, in the long run, it's very important we understand that, it's over time and in the long run, in what labor economists call the labor market's clear. In other words, people do get jobs and not everyone is unemployed. Um, and so whether, we, whether AI is going to be different, uh, uh, whether the way it's laid out is going to be different, then no one really knows. But what we do know is that millions of people are hurt in the process. Millions of people lose their jobs, and many of them are left behind. And so we know two things. First of all, people with limited skills and education, uh, whatever field they're in, uh, are going to be the first people hurt and most significantly hurt by any economic change. And these jobs generally tend to be the ones that require the least judgment. Sometimes it's working with your back. Um, you know, for example, when I was a kid growing up, I worked in the steel mill and uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. And I had the job, eventually, the ultimate job of being a dimension inspector in a rolling mill. What that meant was I took, an, I took a, a rule, and hopefully I remember to put my gloves on before I measured the value. Sometimes I forgot. And I measured to see if the, 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 the gentleman that was operating the cutter down the line from me had properly cut this uh, piece of steel in the right way.
But there was also a surface inspector, and his job was to make sure that it was smooth and so that there were no blisters. Uh, well, you can imagine the innovation that we discovered, especially on the 12 day shift. We shared that job. You would trade back and forth while the other slept. Okay, obviously we don't need that anymore, but when those, I was in college then, and the guys working with me were not. So what happened, those 35,000 people were all checked out of work and, and they no longer make steel, literally in the boundaries of Pittsburgh down to the border right now. But the other group that gets hurt are long tenure workers, people that have been in an occupation for a long period of time, been doing what they've been doing and succeeding very well. And of course we know that's not just the steel worker, but the white collar worker and the office worker and so on. And these people are likely to join the ranks of people who are completely out of the labor market. <coughs> and what we have for those folks is a great difficulty of getting back into work because A, they become stigmatized because if they're not working, there must be something wrong with them, right? So there's the attached stigma to them. And then secondly, they experience age discrimination, which is uh, a very widespread and significant problem in our society. So in this era of change, we had this pattern repeated, as I said, and two things happen. First of all, individuals in history are very slow to react and adapt to these changes. Why? I think it's mainly because they don't believe the changes are all as significant because they occur in their own personal life slowly. And secondly, most people believe they're exceptional. But whatever else is happening, I'll be able to adapt to it. I'm going to be okay. So Americans are very optimistic. The other thing that's happened is that public policies and governments are very slow to react and adapt to these changes. And also, historically in this country, quite willing to leave certain people behind in the process. The first recognition of the impact of technological change occurred in the Kennedy administration in 1962, passed the Manpower Development Training Act. And this funded workers who were hurt by automation. That was the term that was used back then. And by the way, it was nothing very large then. And since then, nothing very large has been done to react to these changes. The United States state spends less on worker adjustment policies than any other OECD country, far less. And most of the programs that we do fund are for anticipating really short and shallow disruptions. So in other words, not for the long-term tenured worker. Uh, and certainly for an economy that is undergoing a mild uh, macroeconomic change rather than the structural changes that I've been referring to. The emphasis also on our program is really essentially to freeze people in place. It's called the unemployment insurance system. The unemployment insurance system is based on an industrial model which says you're out of work because your factory is being retooled or the company is changing and you'll be called back. So it's a temporary support, when in fact, almost all layoffs these days are permanent layoffs. The company goes out of business, that you're, whatever you're doing is no longer needed. And because the workforce programs, by the way, those that are fairly meager in this country are underfunded and declining since the mid-90s in, in per capita, there's less and less of this available. And our education, our higher education system, is almost entirely focused on the first 23 to 25 years of life. So there's almost nothing to support a person coming back unless you're coming back to get a bachelor's degree, in which case you have to go full time and then you get funded. The recent policy trends have also been discouraging. Unemployment insurance, although obviously I'm critical of it, has been reduced. Um, there are no significant job creating programs going on, although we're waiting for the great infrastructure plan somewhere out there in the dark. Um, so what should we do? I'm not just going to complain about it. I want to make a couple of suggestions and then I'll sit down. The first is that we really need to react to those long tenured workers who 
are already in the labor market, especially the oil workers, or people who have dropped out of the labor market, the so-called disappearing workers, the percentage of prime age workers that are not in the labor force right now is at the lowest level it has been for 50 years. So we have millions and millions of people who are uh, not eligible for retirement. They're less than 62 years of age. They can't take Social Security. And they've been looking and can't find a job, so they just quit. And that has enormous implications. <clears throat> for example, it's driven things uh, like the opiate crisis in this country, as you've all heard about, and many, many other suicides, etc. many grim results of that. So what do we need to do? In short term, we need to, to change the unemployment insurance system and make it one is about transitional systems. We need to spend much more on tax credits and incentives for people to engage in retraining and reskilling. We need to emphasize on the job training, partnering with companies instead of the classroom training model, which is train and then hope that they'll get a job. We need relocation systems. We need to subsidize people to move from place to place and help them bridge the gap between the home that's no longer valuable for them, that they cannot sell, and move to a place where they can help earn a living. We need to eliminate the penalties for early withdrawal from 401ks. People that have 401ks now are taxed if they take that money out to educate and train themselves. So that's a sort of a double penalty. We need, by the way, portable health care, which the Affordable Care Act or some version of that needs to continue because this is absolutely critical to keeping people uh, in, in productive situations. And then last but not least, we need to radically improve the quality of information about the labor market and make it available to those workers that have been left behind. So that's for the people that were in the labor market and get disrupted. What about the next generation? the next generation of high school and college students. Well, first of all, we have to face the fact that we have miserable completion rates in both high school and college. Uh, in New Jersey, for example, the high school completion rate overall is around 80%, but in some of our urban communities, it's less than 50 At the college level, uh, Rutgers, for example, our completion rate over four years is only 54%. It's about 65% over six. But some of our, many of our colleges and universities are less than 25% over four years. Okay? And in our community colleges in New Jersey, those who get an associate's degree after three years, one in 10. So what we have done in this country is given people the false promise of access and achievement, but all we gave them was access. So we, number one, all the folks, all the things that we've been talking about, the ability to work with that robot, uh, as David talked about, if you don't have those kinds of skills, you're not even gonna be able to do that. We also have to, most importantly, expand broadband internet access for folks. And I think given mobility internet, it's, it's more likely to happen than before, but more importantly, it's not just about access. We need to increase digital literacy, which is, of course, the world language now. A recent Pew study conducted, for example, said that uh, based on their testing, only one in five Americans are di digitally ready to use the internet and other technologies to learn. Okay, so what I'm talking about is being able to learn and adapt, but only one in five Americans are capable of doing that, even if they have the access to and, and clearly for young people we have to expand transition learning programs because they're going to be shifting from career to career not just from job to job and that means we have to begin establishing things like lifelong learning accounts and creating more incentives especially for small and medium sized businesses to invest uh, and help people learn and support their income workers. I wish I could tell you that those recommendations uh, have a pretty good chance of succeeding. But I, I made the mistake of going back and looking at something I wrote 20 years ago uh, called No Worker Left Behind after I wrote these remarks. 
And I guess I should have been surprised to learn that those recommendations, which were just as good then, are unfortunately still good today. So thank you for listening.